it has, they have not produced any concrete results other than two one plus one dimension. So, so we, don't have, we don't have a program for that. <clears throat> All right, any other questions? All right, so let's go on to see where does the speed of the proton come from, right? The reason was that since childhood, we know more or less, this is a top, you know what, what the angular moment is about. Uh, when I give this talk in Berkeley, people said, well, I should remind young people who these gentlemen are, they may not know. <laughs> this is a Pauli, this is the newest spore, right? Wolfgang Pauli and the newest spore. And in one conference earlier, they're looking at the admiring well, the they spinning do? top. Hmm? They are looking at the spinning top. Right? Yeah, yeah. Why? Why not? <laughs> I don't know. To figure out how they move, I guess. <laughs> to break <figure> out. <laughs> They're talking about the speed, right? So we do have a concept of that, you know, even in planetary motion of the orbital angular momentum. And you go out to galaxy. Then you go down to the level, like a Zeeman splitting. You have the concept of, of speed. You know what a speed is, right? It's, it doesn't have to be relativistic. You have to have a relativistic interpretation of it. And, uh, and uh, down to the even speed up the atoms, molecules, and then nuclei. Even nuclear speed we can always understand. But when you go inside nuclei, quark, gluon, and so on, and then it's not clear where the speed of the uh, proton come from. Now, the first indication of that was really shown 25 years ago now. There was an EMC experiment, which showed that there is a G1 uh, moment in uh, the helicity distribution integrate the sum of that, the sum rule of that, gives you the quark and anti-quark contribution, the quark spin contribution to the nuclear. When people combine various data together, that was a surprise. Instead of having a full spin of the proton coming from the quark model, in the quark model sense, it's coming from the, the quark spin. They're taking some of the uh, non relativistic quark model, a few theory course, you will know that in, in, the, in the textbook you have a speed of two of the quarks lining up this way and the third of the quark going down, and you combine them into a spin one half. Right? That's a classical picture. It turns out that's totally wrong. Because the spin of the pro, uh, uh, quark from the quark contributes only 20 to 30 percent of the spin of the proton. After 25 years, it's pretty much confirmed experimentally. But how the, so where's the rest of the speed coming from? Now you would say, well, there's a glue. It must be a glue because I know of a nuclear. When I give it a kick, right, the, the nuclear moves. I know 50% of that, the momentum, is in the, is in the, in the glue. The quark only contributes 50%, and the rest of the 50% or so, or maybe 40% or so, it depends on what this, is in the glue. So there must be some glue contributions. So people look at this in the uh, Columbus and CERN and STAR collaboration in, in uh, Brookhaven. And then they found this delta G over G. This is a blue uh, helicity distribution over, uh, it's polarized over unpolarized, turned out to be rather small, close to zero. And the most recent results show that perhaps there's a 0.1.2 contribution. 10 to 20% of the proton speed may come from the blue helicity. So that's small. Thirdly, there was two lattice calculations. Only the connected insertions, as I said, remember there's a connected and disconnected insertion calculation. Calculate the connected insertions. And this is what they found, both groups, with the dynamic of fermions down to pi on mass 300 dB. It's not too heavy. Uh, they found the U quark as a function of the quark mass or pi on mass squared. They find the U is, you know, uh, is negative, and D is positive somehow. When they sum them together, this system is close to zero. Very small. Less than, less than a few percent. <clears throat> this is the LHPC and QCDSF. Both groups concluded that. So put them together. The status of the proton spin as well, we know before this, for this calculation so far. This quark spin contributes only 20-30% proton spin. Um, I'll show you some lattice calculation. And the quark orbital angular momentum, based on these two calculations, only the connected insertion I should emphasize, give you almost zero. And the glue spin contribution is very small. And it has been argued by Borowski and, and Susan Gardner in Kentucky also. They argued that the glue orbital angular momentum is zero from the single spin uh, asymmetry expectancy. So uh, altogether, so what's the rest of the spin? So our job is to search for 
the Darksmith. <laughs> Where's the Darksmith? Well, nobody knows. All right? So I'll show you in the rest of the calculation where the Darksmith is. Right? So as I said before, if you calculate the momentum, the angular momentum, the new kind of structure, there are three, three point functions. This is a connect assertion. This is a disconnect assertion. As I said, this is at least two orders of magnitude more expensive than this one. And there's a glue, the glue operator inserted in the nucleon. This will probably be more expensive than this in general. In the past, people estimated using the link variables to divide it in new, they need something like a million configuration in the quenched case. But nobody has, it will take many, many years to have a million configurations with dynamical fermions. People have a few hundreds. All right, so that's a challenge as to how to calculate this point. Uh, so, you know, do that. so remember, this is probably more expensive, more so harder than this calculation. This is at least two orders of magnitude harder than the other one. Well, before I do the calculation, I should show the formalism what operators you use. What we'll be using, uh, I'll, I'll talk about a controversy later, but there's an energy momentum tensor operator <coughs> decomposed in the quark and glue part in the gauge invariant way. And this is shown first by. G. And that one is very simple. The, the quark one is the um, um, gamma mu d nu part, and the glue part is f nu, so the ordinary ones. So if you look at the angular momentum part, uh, besides the momentum, the angular momentum part is just quark spin, gamma times gamma 5, gamma mu gamma 5. And this is r, and this is just x or r cross the covariant derivatives, which is the momentum operator. So it's very simple. And the glue operator turns out x cross e cross b. These are colored, cross colored e colored b. These are pointing vectors, it's so r cross this thing. Right. So that's very intuitive and so on. And these are the quantities we're going to calculate because they're gauging variable. Now, it's hard to calculate this thing, x times something. When you calculate like magnetic moment, so r cross j, the, the vector uh, current, it's very hard to calculate x times something on the lattice. Because we don't know. Usually, when you do this, you put the nucleon here, you know, and look at the angular momentum. But all the lattice, we don't know where the, the origin of the nucleon is. Because it's all moving. We don't know where it is. You have to sum up in the path integral formulation, you sum up all the things without knowing implicitly, explicitly, where they are. So instead of doing this, we look at the nucleon form factors. Okay? So, angular momentum thing uh, in, the, in the nucleon, you can write a, there are four. Um, Operator uh, for form factors T1 and T2, T3, and T4. I model this T1, T2 like the F1 and F2 in the electromagnetic form factor. Remember, the electromagnetic form factor is gamma mu. This is a Dirac form factor, F1. It doesn't have this P here. I have a, a poly form factor which does not have a P, just a sigma mu, Q mu. All right. In this case, the momentum is related uh, for the T1 at zero momentum transfer after realization. Okay? This is like the, um, uh, the F1. F1 at zero is the charge. Right? So here is the momentum fraction. Here is T1 plus T2 at zero momentum transfer gives you the angular momentum. It's like the uh, magnetic moment. Remember, it's F1 plus F2 at zero momentum transfer. However, in this formulation, I cannot just calculate this thing at forward matrix element because T2 in this one involves a cube. If I look at forward, I want to Q2 at zero, but this term will be zero. So I cannot calculate it directly. I have to calculate finite Q, finite moment, and then extrapolate to, um, to zero. Okay, so that's the strategy I've used. The same way we would calculate electric and magnetic form factors. All right, so before I do that, I should show you that we calculate three point functions. I put a current here, nucleon, I create a nucleon at zero, calculate this thing, and, and let it go to. Uh, ground state again with the interpolation fields. Now there is a one specific combination which is polarized once which gives you t1 and t2 and q square, finite q square explicitly. However, I cannot just take this one and extrapolate because the t1 and t2 people found has different functional form. You know, so you cannot use that because t1 and t2 have very fun different functional forms. You have to separate out t1 and t2 and, and extrapolate it separately. And that for that we have to get T1, T2, T3, and not T4, but with a you know, ten equation or so, and then extract that extra, uh, uh, extract all these quantities before we do the extrapolations. Right. So let me before I show you the results, let me discuss a little bit of the normalization issues. Of course, these are lattice operators. I need to renormalize them, 
and then compare and match them to the MSBAR scheme, okay, to compare with experts. Now remember that I have two operators, the quark and the glue energy momentum tensor. Their momentum, you can see this after rheumatization, I have a momentum for the quark, momentum for the glue, that two rheumatization constants. But it's the same rheumatization constant for the angular momentum because these are the same, same operator. Well, I have it once momentum several, in other words, all momentum. Could there be mixing between the quark and glue momentum divisions? I'm sorry? In, in the first night, could there be mixing? Yeah, the I'll come to that. Yeah, that's the point I, I will come to and we'll discuss. It. And the momentum on this one. I assume that this is already, on the lattice, if I acquire this, they're already mixed at, at whatever lattice spacing time. So I'm talking about the first night. Could there be mixing? Yes, there will be mixing. But the, the thing is that after this is done, let me show you this a little bit. Okay, this is um, um, this is when we calculate it's already mixed. Then I'll go back to match to the uh, MSR scheme through uh, mixing matrix. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. <coughs> so you can see from this thing that if I plug in the T1 and T2 here, T1 is here, T2. So I subtract this equation and get T2 for the quark and T2 for the glue, when they add up, it's a zero. Okay, and then what I do next is that I'll assume these are renormalized on the lattice, okay, that I, uh, that I calc uh, do this calculation, mixing matrix elements to the MSPARC perturbatively. So one of our postdocs is calculating these operators, these quantities, and match to the MSPAR scheme uh, at mu equal to, say, 2G. Okay, that's the mixing that we have. We will, we will calculate. <clears throat> All right, so the lattice that I'm going to show you are still the quenched approximation. Right? Dynamical fermion was still coming. The reason we showed you this one was that we, there are eight quantities we have to calculate. Because remember, there are three diagrams connect, disconnect, and the group. I've calculated, after calculate the moment, and the angular moment has a six calculations. right? But to get orbital, I have to subtract the spin. So speed has two calculations, what did it connect and disconnect, so the eight calculations. But so far before this, we have calculated four of the eight. So we thought, might as well finish this, and before we move on to the dynamical fermions. Okay? For this calculation, we have a 500 gauge configuration, 400 noises each, and then 60 nuclear sources, put them in different positions separately to improve the statistics. So here's what we get. As far as home factor is concerned, this function Q squared is a T1 looks like this, T2 is rather flat. Indeed, T1 has a curvature and T2 does not. So I cannot combine them and fit. That would not be right. Just to check whether this is, picture is correct, I have a T1 and T2 extrapolate separately and add them together, T1 and T2. Another choice is I do T1 and T2 without separating and fitting them, I just fit it and I plot them, the numbers here, and you can see, and their, their kinematics are sl slightly different, but here that you can see within one sigma and two sigma. So that's a cross check that our, our extraction of T1 and T2 for U and D separately are reasonable. Okay, this is for the connected insertions. For the disconnected insertions, you can see this is a two times, 100 times harder when we extract it, and again, after the nucleon appears, there's a slope. That's where we fit the slope. And this is T1 and T2 doing a car extrapolation to get physical power mass, uh, physical power mass. And after that, we do the Q squared extrapolation. So there are several extrapolations. From the Q squared, I have to go from these points down to the zero, zero moment of transfer. Well, you notice the error band of the T1 from this goes up very quickly, very large error bar the blue ones, right? But luckily, for the T1, I have a, we have a separate calculation. Remember, T10 is a separate calculation. It's a forward matrix element. It's a separate calculation. We get the blue at the red ones, which is smaller error bar. So therefore, we just use the T1 from a separate calculation, add onto a, a T2 to get the momentum and angular momentum separate, right? So to reduce the errors. For the glue, it's a different story. As I said, people use the link variable to define F and G. It's very, very noisy. Nobody succeeded in doing that. How about just use the cover compared to the overlap? I mean, you can use the cover and then get the F and G. A cover for that F and That's what I'm talking about. You need a meeting configurations. 
medium uh -huh. in that case. I uh -huh. thought you were saying the link variable. That's from the link. Yeah, but value is from the link. Yeah, the but no, 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 the cover, the yeah, move, right. I know. Doesn't operate there. I know. You're talking about. I'm not saying about from the from You're the link. You're talking about this, right? Yeah. Right. But I'm still using the using the the the. the this from the U U U link, right? No, no. I'm not saying this, but the but the but the improved it using, okay, using the code. Okay. But that's the action we're talking about, operator. Yeah, I, I can I can construct a new new from the from the right. That's the way to get a new new. No, people. Every new new is the commutator of the D new new. Yeah. D new and D new commutator. Yeah, sure, you can have. And that. then the D new, okay, instead of using the overlap, I can just use the improved. Uh, use an operator. Okay, that's cool. That should be the same. It's just cool. no, not the same. This is the uh, completely from the link variable, but this is from the fermion operator. Fermion of what? Or, or of the fermion, the direct operator. Oh, the Wilson, the Wilson, Wilson part. Yeah, Wilson. Yeah. So you have a one plus gamma, something like the. Uh, okay, you have the U. That's from that's from the U. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I understand. Difference. I thought it was the same. Maybe maybe you have something else. Yeah, you you can have the get gamma once you multiply the gamma mu and then yeah. you, you, you that's the dear operator, okay? Right, right. Gamma and mu, okay, is the dear operator. Okay. Well I think to to the same order a square yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, well, and the then there's a, a square you proved it. Okay, in yeah. case, okay. You, you can, can compute the F mu mu from the from the using op from, from the from this order you know, I, I suspect we are not that different. I can we have you can improve this one to a like uh, I call that um, uh, the only windmill. You can have a windmill, right? Windmill and so on. You can have windmill things. And so no, no, this is the, not the link variable. You're always using the link variable. I'm not saying the link variable. But action is from link variables. Yeah, but. When you do a commutator, it's still link variables. I don't understand. No, the D mu, D is a direct operator. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, not D mu is u times the side by side. D is of u. No? D mu is the matrix, okay? Direct matrix. It's okay. u times some delta mu u plus a and u plus a or something, right? D in in the in, in one plus gamma i e i or d mu mu. That's the d. Besides, you put a side bar side here. This is the the rock matrix. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you multiply this thing, you're not going to you get you multiply by u. The, the way you get the f from the overlap. Yeah. And then I instead replace the overlap operator by the improved fusion operator. Understand, understand. Yeah. Okay, you can improve it, but improve it is only a small improvement. Remember the reason the that the only I'll, problem of using the the, the uh, Cover Fermion, okay, yeah, okay. getting the FMU is yeah. that in that case, okay, uh, some of, uh, say for example, the FMU, FMU tutor, okay, that turns out is not the uh, integer, okay, in that case. Is it, is it, well, we're talking not an integer. The thing is this, I'll tell you, this one is ultra local. In okay? Then, yeah. Can we propose that you give this to. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's more one. Yeah, please, okay. please don't. don't, don't. Okay. <clears throat> okay. The Dirac operator that we are using, not the Wilson or Clover type, is the Dirac operator from overlap. Overlap is one plus gamma five in the epsilon function. Epsilon is a sine function, which is say one way to say it's h divided by square root of h squared. Okay, at h is a matrix. The reason this is different from that, I should say, this is exponentially local. It's not a one and two lot of space. It has an exponential. It's it's um, it's um, smeared, but with a with a chiral smearing. Right. That's what we think is crucial for the success of this program. We're going to show you. Is that you can use Dirac operator from the OPA from the as I said from the Clover or some improvement. Uh, you can we tried it. It's not nearly as good as OPA because of the, of the chiral uh, smearing. Now. Here, remember that this one, uh, the Dirac operator, as Ching Wei says, you have a this one operator satisfies uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the 
the industry. Yes, that's the industry. Actually, a singer. But he's a singer there. So a singer here, all the lines, all the final lines, as long as it's going to be smooth. So index is related to this drop operator. And there's a local version, which is the local local topological charge give you a four to the Q four. Okay. And this one give you an exact integer on the lattice. It's not you know, two point eight, two point nine, but actually three, for example, exactly. So this is a good show that. It's very nice. And the local one is powerful. People uh, like uh, Ivan Horvath in our group and uh, study this using this operator to study the topological uh, back. Okay. And we found that there are no four dimensional structure. Therefore, just proof with this conjecture, there are no semi classical objects like instant towns in this thing, in the quantum background. The quantum view will destroy that. The only thing left are sub-dimensional along the order. Two sheets of three-dimensional things, positive and negative ones, which has many complications, uh, not complicated implications in the uh, power symmetry breaking and that. So uh, well not, I don't have time to discuss this, but many groups have seen this now. Now, to extend this, well, we can calculate after you knew. But the sigma new is the D of X. Remember, this is a non-local operator, exponentially local, but not extra, not, um, not ultra local. So from this, you can define this and calculate the coefficients as we've done, so that the first terms have been new and have other terms. Okay, and you sim over sum over to s. So this is the operator that we use for the calculation of the group. Given this, this is the first time any seen any anybody has seen any slip lines. First time that using this operator that have, we have succeeded in come in seeing a circle as good as the disconnect insertions. This is the Kara extrapolations. Again, this is Q square extrapolations. And then we replace this uh, larger error bar by the smaller ones for the T10. So altogether, we can put them in a table. For the connect insertion U and D, this is sum. This is disconnect insertion, either U or D or strange. Here it's about 4% for the U and D. Here it's about 2.4% for the U. This is consistent with the uh, various uh, uh, PDFs, which is about 2 to 4 percent. It's not very precise. Hopefully, one can, the lattice may help them pin it this down closer to, uh, uh, to more correct answers. Blue turns out to be 30 percent. Okay. Now, I should say, in, I just check uh, from the CD, CD10, uh, the uh, uh, CTAC group, they said a 2GEV, uh, this is about 40 percent. Now, we're 30 percent off, but let me remind you, this is a crunch approximation. 30 percent is not a very big discrepancy, right? I'm sorry, you have a 56 here. What, what does he mean? That's error bar. Oh, okay. Sorry. So this is rather large. Now, the T2, as I said, this is a 0.6 here, and the negative 0 0.6, 0 0.6, right? The thing is that we've normalized this, I'm surprised, before I did this calculation, I thought, well, how do I know the normalization calculation? If I insist on this, using this, uh, this, uh, this uh, it's the uh, normalization conditions using the summers. How do I know the normalization will come out, the number will come out even positive? Uh, if that calculation, if this is positive, that is positive, then one of the normalization constants has to be negative, because I know they sum up to zero. Okay? And so luckily it turned out somehow it's only 5% from one. It's not that bad. So it's very to my surprise. So but that turned out to be zero, and that's what the, the Brodsky has called this number is a no anomalous gravitational mechanism. Energy moment and tensor, it's like a magnetic moment. Right? And for the angular moment in part, it turns out you add 6% here and you get 0.65. You subtract 6% and you get 25% for the blue angular moment. That's what we get. This is the pattern that we get. All right? So if you look at the, the pie chart, you can see um, for the U and D, for the connect assertion, it's about 60% for the momentum fraction. 31% right? for the blue. And if you look at the U and D separately, this is the U and D. Okay? For the angular momentum, on the other hand, 65% is in the connect assertion, 7% disconnect, and then blue. Uh, the, the strange is rather small. And uh, for the uh, angular momentum, if you divide it by U and D, you can see that U is 6, 76. This is the, the blue is 25% for the angular momentum. All right. Now, we want to go on to the orbital angular momentum. The way to define the orbital angular moment is just take the total angular moment, calculate the total angular moment, and subtract the speed. Yeah. The 
addressed to the orbital of the orbit. I'm sorry, could you go back to the previous slide? Did you compute each part and check the sum, whether the sum is one? We, we demand that to be one. We use the, that's the uh, realization conditions. Oh, that define my realization constants. Okay, I demand the sum of one for the uh, uh, for the for this final lapse to be uh, one. So that's 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 the realization conditions that we use. Like the uh, like a car water did, right? Uh, the DA is two times uh, mass times the true scalar uh, overlap. The Z M and Z P cancels out and use that to define my C <coughs> Because I know in finite I should have uh, the uh, car car water then should come up. Alright, so to calculate then so we need to calculate this quark speed. And quark speed again has connected circuits with disconnected circuits. And the surprise of this is instead of one for non-relative is two quark model, 2.75 in the relativity, uh, and then it's only much smaller. Okay, so the question is where does that come from? Turns out the answer is that this is large and active. There's no OCI suppression. So this is very large and active, and probably coming mostly from an anomaly. This is our very old calculation since we are we have that and we count the rest of it to finish it. So we use the old data. It turns out one of the surprise things that we, we found, there are literally thousands and thousands of papers on this subject. Of all the thousand thousand explanations, I think one stands out is that you are not. Okay. The reason we got that, we, I really think it's true, is that when we look at the loop, the loop is very insensitive to the quark masses. All the other currents, every other, like a, the, uh, the scalar, pseudo scalar, vector currents, are very sensitive to the quark mass that you put in. Here, we vary the quark mass by a factor of four. It doesn't change a thing, to which shows that there must be a scale much heavier than these quark masses in the loop. Right? And that has scale, like it depends on the cutoff, this is from the number, right? Which we are on the way of doing that using dynamical fermions by looking at the low modes and high modes to see how they, how they play out. But this is the likely solution is to do one anomaly out of thousands of explanations. Okay, so let's look at the numbers then. We calculate connect assertions, which is 0.62. And, and the disconnected assertion turns out each one is large and active, U and D and S, each one is 0.12. We multiply the three of them together, we give you 0.25, which is consistent with the experiment. Right? So this is, um, I'm not showing the table after D, everything is, seems to be fine. So now let's look at the table where uh, the angular momentum part, the quark spin part, to subtract that and get the uh, orbital angular moment, right? So I do this, U turns out to be negative, D turns out to be positive, they add up to close to zero. The same as other people looked at, remember in the beginning I showed you from two dynamical fermion calculations where they show this add up to zero, this U is negative, D is positive. In the crunch approximation, we came to the same conclusion. However, the glue of course is 25%. However, for the disconnected assertion part, this is small, you add up to something like 10%, right? But the, group, the, the spin is large and negative. When you subtract that, you have 17% from U and D contributions for the orbital and the moment, 15% from the strange for the orbital. Okay? So the solution to that is because of the glue of 25%, quark is 25%. The orbital angular momentum is almost zero from the connected assertion. All of that, 50% of the of the nuclear angular momentum of the spin is coming from the uh, from the orbital angular momentum. That's the picture that we have so far. It's going to change when we have a dynamical fermion, but it's probably not too far from the final answer, the whole. Okay? But this picture reminds us of the following. Remember, the quark model have all, I don't have glue, I don't have mesons, right? I only have three quarks. All of them together give you proton speed. Another extreme is the square model. It's a topological solid top. No quarks, no glue. Everything is a pi m in the P wave. 100% of that's from